Join us on the Swim Monkey. Swim. Swim Monkey. Swim Monkey. Swim Monkey TV. On the Monkey. Holding water, so much you will know About dolphin kicks, flip turns, dives, and how to find an awesome coach Hosted by Brian Welter and Tyler Kearns Holding water is where competitive swimming is learned All right, what's up guys? Welcome to Holding Yo. Water for our sixth episode Um <laughs> show dedicated to age group swimming. We're excited to have some great guests with us uh, this week, and I'm going to kick it over to Coach Brian Welter, who's going to introduce them. Yeah, we got uh, a couple guests that, you know, I've uh, known Mike Curley for, what's it been now, 20 years, Mike? I don't know. It's been a long time. It has. And, um, he's done a great job there in Central Orlando at Highlander Aquatics for as long as I can remember. They've been one of those teams that everybody's watching out for, and you know, everybody's looking at. And then uh, Megan Easting, who's uh, up in eastern Iowa. or I, Yeah, up there. I don't even know where she's from. She's from somewhere in Iowa. I should know this. My whole family's from there. So you'd think I might know something about it. But I've done a great job. Age group coach of the year last year, right? Better and faster age group coach of the year. And uh, definitely a round of applause for that. And, um, you know, seems to be doing an amazing job in a in – a, a climate that we normally wouldn't think about as being a swimming powerhouse. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Tyler, you want to get it rolling with uh, where, where we're going with this? or Yeah, I think the, some cool uh, topics this week that we put together, we just wanted to, to kind of get a little bit of the relationship side. We've heard a lot last week. If you guys tuned in, we had Russell Mark last week who uh, talked a lot about technique and had some great uh, comments there that, that, that we all heard and, Learned a lot from the, the previous four episodes before that. But this week, we wanted to focus on something a little bit different. So um, we thought about coaches. What are you guys using as tactics or tricks or strategies out there uh, to inspire your athletes and, and most importantly, to build relationships? So, uh, Mike, I'm going to I'm going to kick it over to you. Well, it's first off, it's an extreme pleasure to be on the show. Brian, thanks for asking me and staying on top of me, even when I took a little little break last week with my wife. I was traveling back and forth from New Smyrna Beach. But, um, you know, one of the things I like to do with my kids that, that I've learned over the last 27 years at Highlander Aquatic is build relationships. How do you do that? You, I do a lot of teasing <laughs> and uh, poking the kids. And uh, you brought up the, the fact that you like to ask kids, you know, hey, you know, how come your boyfriend's not paying attention to you or what have you or your girlfriend or whatever it might be. And I like to tease the kids a little bit. But the one thing that I've learned over the last 27 years is to be a good listener. And, um, you know, when I was 29 years old and I showed up on the campus at Highlander Aquatics, I wasn't the best listener whatsoever. And uh, I think through learning the learning empathy and uh, going through a lot of failures and things like that, the things that didn't go well the first couple of years, I became a very good listener. And uh, we use music. We play music on the deck every day. I like to ask the kids what they like to listen to. I like to ask the kids, hey, you know, if you can tell me what this song is, we might get a little bit extra rest. We might uh, do a get out swim or whatever it might be. But Coach Todd Mann, who's running the senior group right now, and I play music every day. And so we use music as kind of the intro to our program. And, uh, you know, we might be playing Grateful Dead or we might be playing Drake. And uh, hopefully the kids uh, enjoy it. Sometimes they don't like the Grateful Dead. Sometimes they don't appreciate Jerry Garcia, but uh, shame on them. Maybe one of these days they will. <laughs> shame on them. Shame on them for sure. Hey, and, and going back to the boyfriend-girlfriend game, which is a game that I also love to play in practice, and all my athletes will attest to it is, it is completely fictional and made up. I have no basis of who I pick for boyfriends <laughs> and girlfriends. It's whoever's in the lane next to them or whoever's coming in late or whatever. And the best part about that game is when they go, oh, my gosh, who told you? <laughs> then you go, oh, you did. <laughs> and now you got a whole nother level of connection that you can build on. But 
I, I think things like that are, are big. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that I do, uh, especially right after move ups, is when you have those really quiet kids who just are very, very introverted. I might say hi to those kids and wave at them with a goofy smile like, hey, how you doing today? Ten times a workout until I finally see that smile crack. And then when I see that smile crack, I know, OK, now we're starting to get in. Now we're finally starting to get somewhere and then I can build on that. But I, I think making that initial connection and then continuing to, to, to build on that connection is, is, is you know, as important as anything we do because we can talk about the greatest most scientific swimming in the world and if it's just going it doesn't make any difference what about you megan well your practices sound a heck of a lot more fun than my practice does. <laughs> <laughs> joking around and um, we've seen your practice megan that looked seriously like, it looked like fun <laughs> i mean I yeah, have you guys fun. stick around till the end to see what she does because <laughs> it's something special i do well right so my my practices uh, are about connecting. Hi, hi, Ben. And so Walton Hills, he he was coaching when I was growing up, and I sure looked up to him a ton. Um, hi, Ben. So um, yeah, we we are we're communicating the whole time. So um, it, it, it's not that it's not that we're not having fun. We're I guess it's more like a like the classroom than the playground sort of and it is I mean it's warm there's a lot of connection going on so in terms of building relationships uh, I'm with them the whole time and and I can you know I can say hi to Nathan and you know check if you know Lily has a tree on her house which we needed to do this past week um, and so the connection, you know, they say make a make a connection, you know, with one person every practice, or um, you know, make make sure that that you that you uh, you know develop that that two way street. And so we're we're doing that the whole time. And um, you know, there is no time when they don't have access to me. And I think the fact that I'm I think they know that I'm working as hard as they are. And I think they, we, we just kind of have a mutual respect. Like I, I think of us more as teammates than, than anything else. I mean, I'm the quarterback, <laughs> but I can't deliver the ball unless they understand the route and unless they, you know, go like heck and, um, and understand how to pivot. So I explained to them how to pivot or, or how it works. I mean, I feel like, we talked about the other day how, you know, you play um, like old Mario Brothers and, and you used to buy these books with like the cheat codes on them. And so the way that I plan practice is that I make sure that I'm giving them some sort of cheat code that, that they might not figure out. Like if you take a left instead of a right on Mario Brothers, you may find out that you're going to get 10,000 coins if you hit the third mushroom or, or something, but you might not figure that out on your own. So every day at practice, I'm trying to give them a cheat code and, and I see them do it and I walk them through doing it. So I think that, that kind of connection, like she sees me, I think my, my athletes would say that I see them and I'm paying attention to them and I'm working hard for them. And I think that's what builds our relationship. Hmm. But I wish I had like that mega dad jokes. <laughs> I don't have any dad jokes. Yeah. Brian's oh, got all the dad jokes I got you need. as many Brian's as you need. All. Let me know. All of them. I'll give you three or four <laughs> websites after this. You can have them. <laughs> I like Megan, the idea, you talked about. I like the idea that Megan was talking about being the quarterback and um, using that type of metaphor. I, I use being a travel agent. <laughs> and uh, I tell the kids, as long as you tell me where you want to go, I can help you get there. Um you know, Megan might be TB12. That's Tom Brady. He's down here in a, in, you know, in Tampa nowadays. So that's kind of exciting. And hopefully we'll be able to go to a game and things like that. But consistently once, twice, three times a week, I'm keep telling the kids that I'm your travel agent, but you got to let me know where you want to go so that we can help each other and do it together. That's great. I love that. That's great. 
That's a great way of putting it for sure. Megan, you mentioned communicating with them constantly. Um, and I know that, that we've had several discussions uh, over the past few weeks um, about something you guys use to kind of communicate. What? How are you communicating with them pretty regularly? Yeah, so uh, the My Swimmers, right? The, that's my mic and, and they, they wear these little headsets. So they put the little headset on and it's bone connection. So they hear me better underwater than, wow. than yeah. So um, the, the first time I kind of brought these out in public, we were at the training center for the girls uh, national select camp. And I asked the head coach who was there. Um, I, I said, I, this is how I coach now. This is how I deliver. This is, who I am on deck, can I bring them? And he said, yeah, but we're not gonna break about the, fir the first practice, we need to do our team building and get to know everybody. And I was like, yeah, that sounds good. You know, I'm just excited that I get to coach the way that I coach. And so anyway, we, we got in the first practice and uh, Dan gave the work, Dan Jacobs from Machine Products, who I just adore. And he's funny. He's really funny. Yeah. And he's uh, a talented, talented man. In so many yeah. different oh. ways. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Layers upon layers. So, um, so he gave the warm up and divided the kids, and they got in, and um, you know, two coaches went and talked to each other, and then one went to go get the water bottle, and the other went to you know clean up the ropes, and I just stood there, like. I'm not doing anything. They're 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 doing their warm up, but I don't feel like I'm contributing. I, I want to contribute, and I, I think that's where a lot of this comes from. Is I want to play too. I like I like coaching as an activity. I like coaching as. I mean, I feel like I'm going to practice, and and I'm gonna like I said, like I'm gonna work. I'm gonna think. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to get it into them. It's got to get out of me and into them, and using the swimmers is, is my conduit to, to, to get it across. So when I say I talk to them all the time, we, we will play music and that's good. We have some playlists that are appropriate and sometimes we do, right? Because one time I put it on like XM radio or something and I was on the <laughs> and I put mine on so I could listen to the music. Cause it, you know, we like, we sing together or whatever. And, and I was like, Where's the thing? <laughs> Not appropriate song. So, um, so we, I mean, we do have fun like that, but what I just feel like I have access to teach. I mean, like when we get into what we do every day, it's it's that cheat code. It's that clinic. I want to. I want them to walk out better than they walked in, whether that's because they know more or that they can do more with what they know you know sometimes they know they can't they can't get it they can't find it they can't find the feel so if i can walk them through that and describe what it is we're getting if they can level up their knowledge or level up their control because i can pull them along each practice you know one inch of practice you know 360 inches or 300 inches that's that's a decent path so so okay i have two questions first one is how large are the groups you're talking about? You said you had a four lane pool, <laughs> right and now, whatever, yeah. and COVID requirements and all this. Like, how, how many how many kids are we talking about in the water? And out of those kids, do all of them have the headsets on, or a few of them, or whatever? Because I have a set of those, but I have three headsets and one transmitter. Oh yeah. So for me, oh. it's almost become a take these like i have an assistant coach that's maybe there and i'm like hey take these kids over there yeah, and go yeah. work on this rather than it being part of my practice does that make yeah, sense if i only had three absolutely i i'd, I'd pull three out and do a semi-private lesson for you know eight sets of 15 minutes or or, or whatever for me I mean, I them. so i i would have a 50, normally during this time i would have a 50 meter pool with everybody on them and i can i just it's like conducting an orchestra, yeah, <laughs> right? We're, we're, we're doing things and the trumpets are doing something and the cellos are doing something and the drums are doing something. And um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's different than a synchro setup because you don't realize how loud swimming is. So when I was a kid, we used to have a, a synchro group work out on the other side of our pool, which is so cool. They are better athletes than 
I think water polo players and, and swimmers combined, but they would play the music sometimes and we would go down in between sets and listen to the music and that was super fun. But as soon as we started swimming, you can't hear anything. So this actually gets better underwater and it's always, my volume's always the same. It doesn't matter whether they're doing a flip turn in lane eight at the other end of the 50 meter pool or, you know, with kids spread out right now, you know, I was talking to a college coach yesterday who was um, discussing their plan with a, a group of college coaches. And they said, you know, we're going to put the barriers up between the lanes and it'll be one to a lane. And, and, and if we stand at this certain point, it'll echo and we can yell across the pool and then we'll cycle them in and we'll yell again. And I was like, I won't say his name, but I was like, what are you doing? What, why don't you just, why are you just talking to them? You don't have, they don't have to be anywhere. You know, so we went to a swim meet this past weekend at the Des Moines Y and the protocol is that, you know, the, the first eight people get in and go to the end of the lane and then the next eight people get in and they go to the 15 meter mark at the other side. And then this 15 meter mark and then these guys get on the wall and then they start swimming. And it was a circus with the yelling and the Tommy and the no and wait and you got to stop and it's breaststroke. And, you know, I just looked over and I was like, we're just swimming. It's just calm. I, I mean, I think that that's one of the things about building the relationship is you don't, you don't have to yell. And even if you're saying something good or you're correcting them or whatever, sometimes when you yell, they, like kids go, like they, they kind of freak out a little bit. And, and you, you got to yell in bullet points because you only got a certain amount of time. But so there isn't any yelling. There's, we're just talking about, what we want. And oftentimes I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll be like, time out, time out, eyes on me. And that happens a lot. And so like today we were talking about the, the bucket and you got to fill your nice big bucket and what that looks like. And, and, and this is where I want your tailbone to be. And this is what a long spine looks like. And I didn't like what I was seeing. So I said, time out and wherever they are, they just look and then I show them and I open it and I say, this is what I want. This is what I'm seeing. And then we start swimming again. So it's really just, Nice. It's just calm and I can think and, and I can teach and I can connect. And especially during this COVID thing, everything is such a mess and everybody's so stressed out. And I mean, it's hard. It's hard. So right now I have 16 kids in a four lane pool, but I would normally have, I would, I start practice for the whole team. So I don't have an assistant teaching the, the first, the clinic stuff. I mean, the seven-year-olds are hearing me talk about Mario Brothers, and this is the cheat code, and, and this is why we're doing this. And we'll split up after to level it up or or to practice a more fundamental balance piece or or whatever. Do, do I know seven-year-olds know what Mario Brothers is. Hey, I won't <laughs> choose the game. That, that. <laughs> I'm not sure if this 56-year-old knows what Mario Brothers is. <laughs> I got it, but I'm saying now it's Call of Duty. It's not Mario hey. Brothers. <laughs> you find something that a little kid understands. And, well, I know. I mean, just, paint the picture. I feel like it doesn't – I mean, we have, a, we have a really broad team. I think it, my team is like Little House on the Prairie right now. It is insane because – it's a one room schoolhouse. They, if they're coming from an hour and a half away, I can't have the eight year old and the 13 year old come at two different times on two different days. That, that's it's gonna work during yeah. COVID. That's all the time I have. And this is it and I gotta cycle kids through and the carpool's coming. That area is coming. So every day, like today, I had a seven, a seven year old and in, in in, in lane one, and then mm -hmm. over here, mm -hmm. I've got you know a, a double hundred meter butterfly girl, it, and so we talk it through. And she's looking up just when I, eyes on me, she's looking up, she's figuring out her tailbone, too. You know, we're all learning. So when the little kid figures it out, he's just not, you know, some they we were doing a little bit of breaststroke kick, and sometimes they like get their whole spine into it. Right. Well, she was over there doing dolphin kick and, you know, she's trying to wave it that last vertebrae. Right. So, so not a ton of undulation. How do we flick and find acceleration? So that conversation is happening. And little Jojo over here is hearing a higher level conversation. So back to like the one room schoolhouse, 
they, they know what's coming and, and they also see that big kids are learning just as much as the little kids are. And sometimes the big kids will, you know, I'll pull them over and, and, you know, teach for a minute over here and then pop back. And it's, it's just during that warm up phase. So I'm not sure how we got started on this, but that's what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, you did, you did say something earlier though. And, and Mike, I wanted to, Megan hit on this earlier talking about calming and, you know, it kind of goes with that second part of kind of inspiring confidence. And I've, I've been to a big meet where Mike's been on deck and seen his athletes go out there and swim really, really fast and look really, really prepared for what they're doing. So Mike, what are ways conversations that you have with your athletes in practice regularly to, to make them confident before they go into a competition? I think we start straight from probably the kids I'm coaching right now, which is predominantly the 10, 11 year olds to 14 year olds that we are telling the kids, it is your swimming. It's nobody else's swimming. We, that's our mantra all the time in practice. It is your swimming, it's not my swimming, it's not your mom's swimming, and it's not your dad's swimming. It is your swimming. Um, and so it gives them ownership. And hopefully by the time they get to that senior group and you might see a kid swimming at the NCSA meet and, and doing really well, that they have taken ownership on it. And, and granted, you know, kids swim and they love to see their coaches smile and their, their parents smile and things like that, but it is theirs. And when they take ownership on it, uh, there's more, the standards matter, the responsibility is bigger, the accountability is better. That's one of the mantras. The other thing we do is no one else determines your worth. And um, once again, we're, we're kind of preaching the ownership thing. You know, I might tell you that I think you're better than what you're doing right now in practice. And I do that a lot. I challenge the kids and say, hey, I think you're better than what you're giving me right now. But it's inevitably it has to be them. And um, the other mantra that we talk about, just like I said, is no one else determines your worth. I'm not going to determine your worth. You have to accept responsibility for it. Those are two of the big things right off the top of my head. So. I'm gonna I'm gonna share a Mike story. The first no, swimming meet Please that I here. ever Please went to at Highlander Aquatics. I was a young coach. It had to be maybe in like 1997, and it was the April long course meet that always has at least a couple sessions to get rained out. <laughs> and Mike's got two lanes of national kids warming up, and. I don't know, Mike, what do you think? 25 kids in each one of those lanes warming up and sure. they're cranking through this warm up and he's got them at my end of the pool. We're all talking and he's having a conversation with the kids and some coach puts a little eight year old boy up on the block at the other end to do a 25 fly from a dive during warm up. And Mike's like, all right, guys, we're getting ready to go. And he looks down the lane and he sees this little kid about 20 yards into the into the 25 or into the 50 fly and he stops the entire group and he has them line up along the lane lines all the way down where the kid is and cheer for the kid as he's finishing his 25 fly the kid gets out mike's like that was awesome man that was amazing you did such a great job and the kid's just standing there has no idea the coach comes over the coach is like I'm so sorry, coach. I didn't realize that was your lane. And you're like, oh, no problem, man. And I thought that was such an incredible, like, example of just, like, spur of the moment, team building was there. Like, you didn't build it then. You built on it. But it was there. That group of kids jumped on board with that. And I thought that was a pretty amazing. And then later on, just to toss this in, later on, he – uh we got rained out and I watched this guy lead a game of charades <laughs> for like four hours in the gymnasium. In the gym. In the gym. <laughs> yeah. And then I had and, to stay uh, after in the gym and clean that whole gym up before school the next day. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But no, I'll never forget that as long as I live. And I always thought that was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. And I thought that was, a, I thought that was a really like, it, it showed me the level of just team that that Highlander club at that had at that time. I mean, you know, you guys jumped on board so quick with that. And those kids had so much fun. Yeah. I mean, and I, I'm sure you all say the same thing, but we're only as good as our assistants. We really are. 
you know, and um, I've had the same assistance from Ty Seacrest. Now Todd Mann's back with me and he was there at the very beginning. Stacey. And now he's went to Bowles and then went to University of Arkansas and now he's back with us. And Stacy Wright, who is the backbone of our program and uh, the reason that we exist, mm -hmm. and the reason we are so successful because she runs such a wonderful swim lesson program. But we're only as great as our assistants. And uh, I can't thank Ty and Todd and Stacy and Lydia Tate and the other people that used to be there like Derek Howworth and Eric Nelson and on and on and on. And uh, we're only as great as our assistants. I, I know Megan says that she's coaching all these kids by herself, but I guess I'm in a truly blessed situation because uh, I'm surrounded by some wonderful people. Yeah, I think uh, just to piggyback on kind of what you guys said with regards to, to relationships, I think it all comes down to just keep it simple. It, communicating with your athletes regularly and making sure that you know, it's an old adage that everybody, it's cliche, but making sure they know you care, not just necessarily about the time that's going to pop up on the scoreboard, um, but also, you know, them as people and them developing as people. Because I think we spend a lot of time together with these kids, it, it, many of these kids we spend as much time with them as maybe not their parents, but second to no one, spend a lot of time with these kids if they're with us through the entire uh, swimming, their entire swimming career at the club level. Uh, so we're going to teach them a lot of life lessons. So it's, I think it's really important that, that we understand that, um, you know, coaches out there, if you're young, uh, you know, go, go in and, and build a relationship first, because once they know that you care about them as individuals and as athletes, they're going to listen so much quicker. And, and they'll follow you because they'll believe in what you're doing because they know you believe in them. And then uh, before I turn it over to Brian, because I know he's going to have a second question, Coach Ben Davis has jumped in here a couple times. Coach Ben, I owe you this, uh, the Lori Lawrence book. I'm going to send it to you soon. Uh, so just finished reading that. Uh, it's a great read with a lot of great stories like Brian just told about Mike um, and, how, and how inspiring coaches can be. So, Brian, I'll, I'll shut up now and turn it back over to you. Brian, Brian, before you start, yeah. I don't want to bring up a negative thing, but one yeah. of the things that I, I do, and, and I don't want this to come off the wrong way, that I'm really struggling with in this COVID thing is the power of touch. <laughs> I, I put my hands on the kids a lot. <laughs> I put my hands on their shoulders Six. and I put my arm around their shoulder and I put my hands on their ears and, and, and what have you. And and manipulate their hands when I'm trying to teach them specific things. I, I'm not, I don't have anything to talk with them in the water. I use my voice for that. But one of the things I've really struggled with since about March 17th is, is the thought that I, I can't touch people. I can't put my hands on them and say, at a boy or at a girl or, or, or whatever it might be. And I, I, how do you guys feel about that? Maybe that's just me and I'm, I'm more of a, I don't know, old school, put my hands on you and manipulate you and poke you in the, when I'm teasing you and things like that. But are you, are, is anybody else struggling with the, the lack of touch? Uh, I, I absolutely am. Um, I, 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 I'll, we, we do the air fist bump. Right. Or the with, elbow or know, yeah. I mean, we don't do the elbow, but we'll do the air fist bump and uh, occasionally ends up being a real fist bump because the kid will not realize it's supposed to be an air fist bump. Um, but uh, as far as when you're talking about teaching, um, I've found myself trying to explain m more muscle groups and muscles that need to be engaged rather than moving them through the motions, yeah. if that makes sense. Like I, I, I have try to explain it differently so that they understand what it is I'm trying to get them to do through their core, maybe keeping your hips tight, keep your hips flat, whatever. However, I'm explaining it. I'm trying to explain it to get where I'm going. Whereas it would have taken me 10 seconds if I could actually go, okay, keep your hips still. Now <laughs> let's have this shoulder movement or let's have this extension here where we're in line all the way through. And now you know, you, you almost can't do it. I also have had them mimic me doing it on the pool deck where we're standing six feet apart, of course, socially distanced. And we, we, we go through the motion together. And then right here, what, 
where where are you pulling from? What part of your body is engaged here? And and talk about that. But that that's it, it's not like it used to be. That's all I got for you, Megan. What about you? Yes, uh, you know I will I will reach out to pat him on the back because that's sort of my you know just that that's my way of encouraging them and uh, yeah you gotta you gotta pull back it's it's certainly challenged my verbal agility you know that that game that you play in in the beginning of you know speech class or communications class where you sit on the side of uh, two sides of a wall or a divider and you have to describe the the picture and they have to draw it and um, it's it's really challenged me to be specific about what I want to describe it as best I can and and yes I will demonstrate with my body but you're right it's not the same I mean I used to teach uh, crossover turns to little kids by you know they they come in and I'll instead of having them come down will stay up and so I'll grab their their hand and I'll you know push the other shoulder so that they touch the wall in the right place and then I'll move their head and their their hand away from each other and we can do that now. Yeah what what, what stroke specifically has been the most challenge for you guys with with that for me honestly it, it may sound weird but it's been backstroke just because of the amount of overreaching that I'd normally be able to Say no, put your you know put your hand in, not not over here, and come across. Um, but for me, that it's been it's been backstroke, especially we've been Brian and I've talked several times on the show about a, a backstroke drill we've worked on a lot lately, and um, you know engaging that catch in the right position and making sure you're turning into that catch. Um, so for you guys, what what stroke's been the hardest? Go ahead, Megan. Uh, I, 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 equal degree of difficulty. For me, you know, because it's all yeah. it's all verbal and and sometimes it's really it's hard to describe. But yeah, equal. I would say that um, for me, I really like so I really like to have a kid put their arms out here when we're talking about butterfly. Put their arms out here, and I'll take them by the wrists, and I will literally twist the wrists to get them to press their chest down as their hands are coming up and get that feel of where I want that chest to be in line right here with those shoulder blades coming together and that chest going down. And I, I can't do that. And I don't know that you can explain that the way that, that it's just not the same. Um, I don't know. So that's been the biggest challenge for me. I guess um, we were fortunate enough that uh, what, about six weeks ago, um, I, I dare say this, my youngest son's girlfriend, Casey Fans, <laughs> swims at the University of Louisville, and she's pretty talented and pretty great off the blocks. Um, maybe, maybe Hayden will not be taking her tomorrow. But anyways, um, she was fortunate enough to come down here and offered to do a little clinic with the kids. And when you have a, a person of that stature and that person that's that explosive off the blocks, we wanted to do a start turn, start uh, clinic. And she was phenomenal. But I tell you what, it was just so, so very tough not to help kids get off the blocks and use their back foot and, and put their feet in the right position. And we, have, we actually have blocks that have wedges and trying to get their feet and the wedge in the right spot. But um, stroke wise, um, I, I'd say they're all really difficult. I agree with uh, Tyler about the backstroke and the overreaching, but uh, I can think specifically about how great Casey was uh, communicating with the kids, but it required it required so much hands-on that it was like, you, do you mind if I touch you in the heel here and put your foot in the right spot and things like that. But uh, it was a great experience. She was phenomenal. Apologies, Hayden. Sorry about that, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, one of the things that, you know, that Brian came up with that he wanted to ask you guys about, um, and both you guys have, have had success over a period of time. Um, Megan recently with the, the National Age Group Coach of the Year with Fitter and Faster. Um, Mike, over time, you know, long-term development's always been a, a buzz phrase. 
for uh, for coaches across the uh, across the country. So, uh, where do you guys find that happy medium? And Brian, correct me if I'm wrong. The way you wanted to, to ask it, where's that happy medium Ooh. between? Can you have long term and short term success? Yeah, I guess the the, the question, I, you know, I, I I coach a handful of ten and unders, and then I also coach a, the, our top eleven to fourteen year olds. You know, our tags level kids. Um, and I hear people talk about long-term development all the time. And how it's almost like they're telling me that because my kids are being successful between 11 and 14, that I'm hampering their long-term development. Um, and then maybe I should be doing something different as 10 and unders. I don't know. But I'm interested as y'all's thoughts on that and the traditional USA Swimming ASCA you know, we needed to build the base, build the base, build the base. Don't worry about how fast they are mentality. Um, seems to me like an archaic principle, but hey, I'll leave it at that and let you guys have it. <laughs> Go for it, Megan. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. I, I, Brian, I'm 100% with you. I, I'm not doing anything different than I would do with anybody else. I'm trying to teach them how to get better and help them do a, a higher level move that's going to have a greater impact and, and a larger margin of return. And I mean, the, the thing about when you teach, when, when you're leveling them up technically, technique wise, it's with little kids, like shooting fish in a barrel. They're getting hit so fast just because they've simply learned how to do the stroke properly before somebody else has learned to do the stroke properly and a proper stroke is proper because it's fast. It goes faster when, when you have, when you don't swipe the catch and you go out there and then you, then you align into it and it's just faster. So yeah, Brian, I'm with you. I think there is a little bit of a taboo about, you know, when you're, when your young kids go fast, like when, when Mason said his nag in the 500 free, you know, everyone ironically, <laughs> went up to my husband at the meet <laughs> and asked him what he was doing to get him so fast. And um, I just kind of watched and laughed because they said, well, how, how are you training him? You know, I just kind of like listened over all the questions and are you training him like a senior swimmer? Are you, how much aerobic base are you doing? And, and, and these questions that just didn't make any sense in the context of what I'm actually doing. So, before we kick into Mike, I want to throw one little thing in. And Mike, I want your input on this as well. What I found is, is that if you find a little bit of success when you're younger, you're a whole lot more willing to stick with a sport than you are to go play baseball, basketball, volleyball, soccer, where if your team wins and you might not even have played five minutes in the game, you get a I won trophy, whereas in swimming, we don't give those away. Yeah. Where, uh, where so, is it written that you can't be fast all the time? Where is it written right. you can't be fast can't be at every age? Group? And my thing yeah, is, is if I got a kid who's a really good breaststroker, and we can spend maybe a little more time on breaststroke, and we can get some victories, and now that kid's going to buy into what I want him to do at 10 years old. Now I can turn him into a butterfly or a backstroker and a breaststroker and a distance freestyler because now they want to come all the time, and now they want to listen, and now they want to learn because they got that taste of success rather than me telling them, Nope, you can't move up because you can only swim breaststroke. Yeah. So, anyways, I'm gonna leave it. I'll, I'll shut up now for a while. That's too much of me already. <laughs> All right. Our our goal in our program is that everybody becomes a 400 IMer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> having, been, having been coached by Bill Peak, Denny Persley, Bill Wadley, um, everybody becomes a 400 IMer in our program. And kids that might come from a different program and say, hey, you know, you, I've seen a lot of success with your kids to swim the 50 and the 100 freestyle. I'm going to say, well, that's great, but you're still going to swim the 400 IM. Um, the other thing is, Brian, I concur 102 percent, if that's even possible. I don't think it is, but I agree 102 percent. That's a lot. That that's a lot. Two percent better, right? Two percent better. Than, Not but, quite 110, but I'm getting there. <laughs> I Kids stop swimming, not because they're burnt out, because they stop having success. And it's our job, my job, Megan's job, Tyler's job, Brian's job to somehow build a relationship that helps kids succeed. And if they succeed, you should never retard that. 
Never, ever, ever retire that. Be there at 10, 11, and 12. Now, is there a fine line? No 11, 12-year-old kid should probably be going 12K a day. But if we're teaching them proper mechanics and somebody is succeeding, push, push, push. Yeah, I think there's an assumption that just because I'm 11 and 12 is swimming fast, you're you everybody you're putting all this work on them you're over training them you're treating them like this high school boy or college kid and i just don't i mean they're going to like megan already said they're growing they're getting mm -hmm. taller they're getting stronger if you teach them proper mechanics and, and brian and i had this discussion a white oh yeah absolutely they're getting smarter <laughs> brian and i had this discussion i guess right when the the uh, rankings the new age group rankings came out everybody jumped on it and wanted to to really go aggressively at that. And um, maybe it just means that some of these teams have coaches that are doing a really good job of instructing kids and teaching, you know, I, I don't know why so, that's so got to be such a, a, a crazy thought process. And, and okay. So I'm going to throw this out here and I don't even know that we need to discuss it, but I'm just going to throw the rattlesnake in the room is all this conversation that we've had over the last 15 years about how you go look at the 12 and under top 100 rankings and you don't know who any of those people are. Is it just me, guys? Or I've gone back and looked at those. And I don't know, like that that Coglin girl, she was pretty good. The Franklin girl, she was pretty good. Like, you know, one Amy guy. Van Dyken, Tracy Calkins. Like, I go through that list of top 100. And those are people that I know. So w w where is this concept of, 80% of the people who are top tw or top 100 when they're, you know, age groupers wash out of the sport. Well, Brian, I think they're talking about, they're, they're talking about physical maturity, which I can't control anyway. Yeah. There's nothing I can do about, you know, when puberty hits and how it goes, you know, it's like if you're teaching a boys choir and they, their voice changes. That, that's not because of bad coaching. Megan and her orchestras. I, there's some <laughs> <laughs> very physical. <laughs> I'm working with a totally different band here, and uh, I, it's not an orchestra. <laughs> but no, I, I, I just I don't know. I was curious as to your thoughts because I I get into national team coach arguments all the time. Like I argue with these guys, and I'm like. You guys tell me this all the time, but you don't ever coach age group. And have you actually gone and looked at that? Or do all you guys just tell each other this so you can bark at us about it? Because I don't get it. And Mike, you are on the other side of that coin. So, I mean, do you understand what I'm saying? I do. I, I do. I've coached at Highlander Aquatics, the senior group, out of 27 years, maybe 24 of them. And uh, uh, the last two and a half to – Almost three years, Todd's had that group, and uh, I've been working with the younger kids, and I, I'm just as happy, if not more happy, because so much more teaching goes on. And believe it or not, a lot more thank yous. <laughs> yes. You know? And that means a lot when you're making X number of dollars an hour, but it's pretty cool when the 12-year-old kid swims that 200 fly for the first time, makes her first flag cut in the 200 fly, and then maybe – Two months later, swims it at the flag meet and wins the damn thing, you know? And then there's a lot of thank yous and things like that. So, you know, I've, I have been. I've coached the kids that have been to Olympic trials and all that great stuff. And now I'm coaching these little 12-year-old kids that are so fun and so happy all the time. And, uh, yeah, it's it's great stuff. Great stuff. Where are we at? We got about five minutes. Do we want to go into our uh... – yeah, just just real quick because we got we got practices coming up. We got a main set coming up from both of these guys. Just real quick, I run through like the Megan's, <laughs> right? It's really it's it's it, they work out. We're gonna do that. To we're we're yeah. gonna do that. But <clears throat> you want me to do this one, Tyler? Since I'm kind of yeah, yeah. So what? So this is geared mainly towards um, I would say like eleven and under type of workouts where it's um. You know, if we're talking about younger kids. We're talking about where we're not putting together necessarily season plans. Is this something like how do you guys structure your practices? Is it I have a practice structure that I use every day, then I modify that practice structure based on what stroke or, you know, what it is we're focused on that day. 
is it a weekly plan to where you do Mondays, you're doing fly, Tuesdays, you're doing back, Thursdays, you're doing breast, Wednesdays, you're doing, you know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And you go through the week like that. Is it, we have a season plan where we work on the beginning body line core stuff for the first four weeks. Then we develop into some stroke mechanics and stuff. And then we develop into, you know, race pace type stuff like wh or where in that does it fall? For younger kids, I'm talking like 11 and under or 10 and under. Like, how do you go into that? Because I'm I'm dealing with that group now and I'm a seasonal guy. And I'm struggling a little bit because the parents expect more of a day to day approach to what it is that I'm doing. So that's why I'm asking. This is more of a me question. <laughs> I go ahead, that. Megan. Oh, um, well, OK, so for me, the season plan is I'm just cycling through things I want to level up and and trying to get as far as I can every day and then try to try to step far between cycles. So I, I, when I think about what I want to accomplish, I think about the things that I'm going to need. And so I call them like these little buckets, like I'm going to need a bucket of, you know, uh, turns and, and, and these are the turns that I want to get done. And, and I'm going to need a bucket of racing for 40 seconds. You know, I, I need a bucket of like, go and I need a bucket of maintenance you know I can you can you hold your core together and hold your catch even if it's longer than a 200 or a 300 can I step that every the next time I cycle through my buckets maybe it's a 250 maybe it's a 300 it's a 350 and if I think I can do a 500 then I'm going to but there's sets that I give where it was too far and I give the same focus point that I did the time before because I can't climb a stair. We, we, did, we didn't accomplish it. So the teaching part at the beginning of practice, I go for uh, my cycle right now is 18 practices. Just It, it was just COVID related and that's kind of how it happened. But I, I stick for those 18 practices with um, a cheat code for a, a, a stroke. So we're in a breaststroke phase right now. So I'll teach that and then I'll do a progression based on that to try to integrate it into the stroke. And then I'll go for some of the uh, training effects. Uh, and I don't mean training effect like, like I don't know, like, like you would do a college swimmer, but a training effect meaning I can hit a high speed turn. So we're gonna go 50s on a minute. We're gonna go the first 35 meters fast or whatever, or I'm gonna try to hold my stroke. And so we're going to, you know, put the paddles on the right hand and we're going to breathe to the left and work on the high opposite catch and see how far we can take that before they turn to goo on their catch and start swiping that. Or, I mean, I, I lay out the things I want to accomplish and then how I want to accomplish those things. And then I put them in my plan and then I cycle through as hard and fast as I can teach, not as hard and as fast as they can swim, but as hard as I can teach and I want to go as far as possible. And sometimes I think I can go farther, faster than I really, than they really can. <laughs> yeah. So I follow them. I, like there was a set that I tried to give uh, two weeks ago and it, it was not good. And so I went back to two cycles before and I repeated that set to see if we had competency and confidence at that level. And we did. And so I, so I kind of, got off the off ramp and circled back to exits. And then I got back on the on ramp and then, and now we're driving and I feel like I'm in a better place because we have a better foundation. So I do. You're, plan, but it's, you're full of analogies. What? Yeah. <laughs> you said you're full of analogies. Yeah. Her yeah. first or second did not. It's, I, she is amazing. I need <laughs> to get my tail up to Iowa uh, where I went to school, university of Iowa and uh, go see some of your practices. And that's one of the things that, uh, as a 56-year-old man, uh, becoming a better listener, um, we borrow and, for lack of better words, steal everything, don't, don't we? You know, you listen to people. Nothing is better than going to a swim meet at, well, I'd rather think of other places to go, but let's just use iDrive and listen to Martin Barrow talk to his kids or to take the time to sit next to Randy Reese and listen to Randy when he's, you know, 
uh, at least speaking to his swimmers and, <laughs> the kid and really, really communicate with the kid. There, you know, I, I just remember some of the things that Eric Nelson said when he was working with me and now he's the head coach at T2. And, and I still use his phrases, the relationships and the way he could communicate with kids were amazing. Uh, Brian, just to backtrack before we keep moving on. Um, one of the phrases that I've started using, and I didn't really hear anybody else say this in my lifetime, but I've used it a couple of times when parents have questioned me is, and, and without being an ASS, I always say, if you don't feel I have your kid's best interest at heart, yep. maybe Highlander is not for you. And it really kind of puts them back. And yep. I say it with all sincerity, sincerity. I don't say it as an ASS. I'm saying, listen, nothing is more important to me than your child's success. And right. if you don't think I have their best interests at heart, we're going to have a problem. And it, and it would be a way easier for me not to have this conversation. Yes. I mean, that's I always started off with, I could easily not have this conversation, but I'm having it because you and I both care about your kid. Yeah. And yeah, no. Um, all right, we ready to move on to uh, main sets here? There it is. Look at that. Fancy graphic and everything. Flashing graphic. All right. Um, all right. Who wants to go first? Who, let's see. I think uh, Megan's got to go. Megan's oh, got to go. You're, I got bedtime by 10, Megan. <laughs> all right. So let me, I'm going to run you through what I, what I wrote and what I did and I'll be quick and you can read the notes and you guys can have a copy of whatever, but. Did we put it up? Yeah. It's up there right now. Yeah. So that first 10 minutes snorkel swim is when we talk about what's going on because um, there's a lot going on right now, especially in Cedar Rapids. So we talk about um, logistics and we have kind of our little team meeting. And then we start talking about what our cheat code is of the day. I don't really call it that, you know, to them necessarily, but we talk about what we're going to learn. And today we talked about um, how your tailbone affects your spine line and in breaststroke. And we told a story of, um, uh, when, when I was swimming a long time ago, Megan Jendrick is from where I'm from, yeah, Megan Kwan, and we were swimming together and we were talking about where your hips go. And I said, well, you know, you got to pull that tailbone down. Right. And she says, what are you talking about? I said, well, to find your line. And she goes, no, you, you lift it up to find, to get your hip height. And I said, why, why would you do that? You know, and, we, and so we realized she was talking about breaststroke and I was talking about it's from freestyle. And we realized just how different the body stance was. And so, so when I have those conversations, I try to talk to the kids about that type of thing. So we talked about, we did, you know, uh, breaststroke kick going down and flutter kick coming back. And we tried to have them organize their tailbone. And then we did breaststroke pull with fins to try to find their line. And then their tailbone had to be agile. And then they came back freestyle where they had to hold that length. And it's a totally different body position. So the set that, I, that we did today that I really, really liked, we talk about how there's sets to train the stroke that you have and there's sets to level up the stroke that you have and, and create a different better stroke. This was a set to create a different better stroke. So those two 150s in the middle there, uh, we all with your snorkel. So we started off sculling. Hold on. Yeah. Hold on. What's Cobra Strike Kick Drive? Or pop, pop, pop with Cobra Strike Kick Drive. Is that basically just like a wide, high glide driving forward? I'm, I'm trying to get them to get their arms ahead so they can lengthen that side of the teeter-totter so it'll come down and kick. And I'm trying to give them momentum to get in the line that they're going to kick downhill. So it's that, right, that little Cobra Strike. And that's a Milton Elms thing from like a long okay. time ago. He was important. Sorry. When I was in Seattle. Didn't, so didn't mean to interrupt, but I didn't want to miss something. Yeah, no, we, we, I mean, we talk a lot about body lines swimming, swimming, swimming downhill and, and how do you get there, especially in breaststroke. I, you know what we talked about today is that a position from the outside is not the same thing as a position from the inside. So, so yes, great job that you put your arms in front of you. That's, that's lovely. But you have to also climb into the space that you just put your arms into. You, you, you have to, you have to lift from the inside. You can't just put your arms out there when we talk about extending and leaning, it's not it's not good enough to biomechanically put pieces like when you're doing a, a yoga pose, like a downward dog thing, 
you can go into downward dog and then they come around and they're like, okay, now press your heels and lift your spine and straighten your abs. And, do, and all of a sudden you're doing something completely different. that doesn't feel anything like what you started with. And that's how we talk about swimming is it's, it's, it's not the mechanics that you get your, your forearm vertical. It's how you got your forearm vertical. Did you, know, did you do it from this outward sweep? So we started with the skull and the, the, the figure eight. And how that figure eight is exactly what I'm trying to do to get in. So I'm not trying to just drop that. I mean, what, look at that position. That's like ridiculous. I have to align, but that's not going to be good enough either. When I align, I have to do my figure. Eight. I have to gather. We talked about the gathering and how you only have a moment to gather. And then it's like, if, if you miss that gathering, you didn't hit the ball. So there's nothing else you can do. The moment's lost, right? It's a strike. You got to wait for the next stroke. You got to wait for the ball to come again. So this set was designed to help them find water and, and not just this figure eight motion, but find that water. And then as you extend, I want you to add a skull into the top before you go, add a skull into the top. And then we put a right arm, left arm back to increase the degree of difficulty because that's harder on your balance. And they've got to find, you know, this like skateboard weight shifting to happen and like when do I turn in during the gathering and so I made it harder and then I had them do 250s where it was freestyle swim but integrating the stuff that we just talked about and it's easier because we still had our snorkel on during this time yeah <laughs> so um <laughs> so the, the idea of this set and and I mean basically any set in the first hour of practice and you know if it's the little kids that is the practice just this kind of talk. I, I'm trying to get them to be better than they came in. They, they, they understand, they have an idea of what they're, they're supposed to be doing. And that set moved into 800s where they got to play with it. And I said, I don't care about your time, but I want you to kind of get gooey and figure out where to tighten the screws because you're going to get gooey. And then we added the breath. We took off the snorkel, added the breath. And that's where we talked about that high opposite side. Like you can't, you cannot pull while you breathe in that I'm very, very pushy about that because it won't, it, nothing, it won't work. You, you can't just drop and then you end up over here and you've missed that gathering. So you've got to align for the gathering. So we talked about that and then we moved it into, we talked about big buckets and uh, body position and, and how, you know, your arms aren't just above you. You have to send the energy through and lift it up in there in order to roll it and, and find speed. So we, we talk about the fundamentals from the inside. Yeah, there's my, there's, there's, there's my big bucket. And I said, it's not that your arm is out here. It's that you're opening your pecs and your lats and you keep those open for as long as possible. Because if you don't have tension through the system, it's like you broke the circuit. So the, the over kickers that are very catch up -y, and I have one on my team that's just an amazing kicker, but also completely disconnect the arm every time his arm goes forward. And so I, I tried to explain that once you, once you open up into this bucket, you have to stay connected there you can't you know just bring it in because now I got to wait for my body to catch up and then I can do my gathering but this take you know if I go here this takes a lot of time and then and now I'm behind and you've got this this you know kicky 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 kick, 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 like little freestyler right so I, I try to address what I see and help them understand in a kid way you know the physics of water and bodies and tension and movement and power. And like, we talk about a baseball swing a lot and, and a triple jump, you know, we talk about a triple jump a lot when we're talking about short axis stuff, because oh. you don't broad jump down the thing. You got to move it. Right. So <laughs> I first question that. Is, <laughs> <laughs> my first question is, is <laughs> looking at that practice, Okay, and all the scribbling all over that practice. Is this something, and it may be both, is this something that you do that you take home and you put in a notebook or a folder or whatever, and then you go back to later? Or is this just your way of putting down your thoughts on paper so that you know what it is you're doing forward? Or is it like a combination of both? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Fair enough. Mike, you're up. 
<laughs> Look at that. That's the same. It looks the same, Mike. It looks exactly the same. It looks exactly the same. Now, I do have to say that by the end of the practice, my sheet looks 27.7% like yours because I've taken notes on my sheet of paper. But yeah. um, for the next time, we might do things. But, um, you know, my main set is the very beginning there at 3.30, dry land and torpedoes. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I don't even know where to begin to follow this. But uh, each day I start with my age group kids, torpedoes off the bottom of the pool. And uh, I got to tell you, seven, eight months ago, it was a daggum mess. And uh, now we actually do it pretty darn good. Uh, pushing explosively off the bottom, exploding off the bottom of the pool. Our whole pool is about six foot nine the entire way. 50, we're very fortunate we have a 50 meter pool and we do three sets of 10 at least. Uh, one day I accidentally made a mistake and instead of putting torpedoes, I wrote topedos, T-O-E. So that has been a running joke for about a month now. And the kids, of course, catch every single mistake that I ever write on the on the pay, paper here. So now torpedoes are pushing off the bottom of the pool with their hands to try to get their feet out of the water, which is oh, perfect. Well. So we either do three sets of 10 torpedoes or we do torpedoes. So that's really fun. But anyways, I don't even know what set you want me to talk about here. I, I, I don't well, I just talk us through here. the workout. I don't have buckets. I don't have I don't have orchestras. I don't have microphones. I don't have headphones. Baseball swing. Baseball swings. <laughs> hey, you got yeah, music. I got, you got music. music. I got the Grateful Dead, Jerry Garcia playing <laughs> Dead Prudence. It's a wonderful thing. But, um, you know, when she's talking about the gathering, I'm assuming she's kind of talking about being patient and the catch up up front. And one of the things I heard the late, great Richard Quick say is, you should have the power of the pinky and you should initiate your stroke being patient up front and starting every freestyle stroke with uh, with your pinky. Uh, we do a lot of sculling like Megan was talking about there and uh, feel for the water. Um, I, I use almost every one of my sets. I think they're all main sets as entertainment. And uh, I guess at 458, 459 or whatever it is here, um, once I get the kids in pretty good shape and we used to be able to do things out of the water and, and be a little bit closer to, together, I, I like to do a lot of circuits with our kids. And um, I try to make the practices kind of fun and not just swimming in the water. And you can see here we got eight fifties, uh, three fast, one recovery, and that takes about nine or 10 minutes. And then the move to the next set and 1025s with fins, odds underwater, evens, one breath, sneaky breath, freestyle. And then the last set, um, as they're moving through the circuits of about four to six kids, depending on you know the how many people are in my group that day, is we we incorporate ropes. And I'll have the kids do ropes for about 20 to 30 seconds as hard as they can. And then I'll say, go, and they got to drop the ropes. And then they run from about 20 feet away and they dive in the water. And I like, I like my kids to try to be athletes. I know they're swimmers, but try to be athletes. And then they have to sprint down to the other end after doing 20 or 30 seconds worth of ropes. And uh, you're talking about battle ropes, not jump yes, ropes. Yes. And the kids love it. You know, it's, it's, it's entertainment. And uh, you can only do so many, you know, three, five hundreds to send one to three. That's necessary. Don't get me wrong. But, uh, you know, three five hundreds gets a little boring sometimes. So uh, we like to do circuits sometimes and that with our kids. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's good stuff, guys. Um, I appreciate both of you guys. We appreciate both of you guys coming on with us tonight. Yeah, this, spending this was great. An hour of your time. Yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> Megan, I'd love to see what that whole book of workouts looks like. I, I can't imagine how many pens you go through on a weekly basis. Yeah, I bet those pages are just hey, obliterated. So what what are, are you a pen snob? What's your favorite pen? Oh, I am actually right there. He's okay. What is it? Pentel Maybe. under gels? Uh, no, it's a uh, what is a it's a zebra point smallest possible. Yes, it it is the smallest. Laugh at me, he knows this. It, Wow. Wow. All I I'm care is Intel about Energy guy. for first place. <laughs> there you go. Intel I like Energy that, Mike. I'm right there with you. Answer. I but tell anyway. you what, I, fantastic. I, I, it was a pleasure 
to be on here with you. I hope to get a meet sometime in the future and, and talk over these things. This was fantastic. Brian, thanks you, thank you for conning me into this. And You're welcome, buddy. I knew you'd be great, and I knew I wanted you on here. And Joe had my back the whole time, so you can blame him too. <laughs> yeah, I figured as much, but Tyler, always good to talk to you. Absolutely, man. Guys, thank you guys so much. Um, everybody out there, we hope you guys have a great week. And uh, we'll see you guys next week. Take care. Right. Great job, Megan. Join us on the Swim Monkey. Swim. Swim Monkey. Swim Monkey. Swim Monkey. Swim monkey. TV. 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 On the Monkey. <laughs>